Hello to all, and thank you for joining us for this presentation on psychiatric providers in Nebraska. My name is Amy Holmes, and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Behavioral Health Education Center of Nebraska, or BEACON, as most folks know us, and I will act as your moderator today. Before Tom Rauner starts his presentation this morning, I'd like to tell you a little bit about BEACON. We were created by the Nebraska Legislature in 2009 to address the behavioral health workforce shortage in Nebraska. And I encourage you to check out our website um, and our Facebook page. On our website, you can learn more about the services we offer, and those include recruitment, retention, and training for behavioral health providers in Nebraska. And we have a special emphasis on rural areas uh, where we know the uh, shortages are extremely critical. Here are some upcoming events uh, that we wanted to make you aware of. Uh, we are able to offer continuing education credits for some of our online trainings, both the live trainings and the ones that are available on demand on our website. So I encourage you to check those out and uh, spread the word and let people know that those are available at no cost. You see here uh, we have a retention webinar series, and this is the first installment in that series. And this should provide a lot of information about uh, effective methods of retention for behavioral health staff in Nebraska. We hope you'll join us for those. And more info to come on those soon. Also wanted to make you aware of our jobs website, which was launched fairly recently, NebraskaBehavioralHealthJobs.com. And this is specific to behavioral health related jobs in Nebraska and is free for use by potential employers and job seekers alike. You can let me know if you have any questions about that. And with that, let's go ahead and get ready to begin our, our uh, presentation today. Your presenter will be Tom Rauner, and I'll let him talk a little bit more about what he does. But um, he is with Nebraska's Department of Office of Rural Health, or excuse me, with the Department of Health and Human Services in Nebraska. And um, with that, Tom, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Can you hear me, Amy? I can. Okay, great. Uh, yes, i am uh, been with the Department of Health and Human Service here uh, for almost 31 years now, uh, 20 of them uh, basically addressing a lot of the issues with health workforce in Nebraska. And so it's uh, my pleasure to be able to go ahead and, and visit with you uh, today, and hopefully we'll be able to share some good information and um, <clears throat> be able to hear back from you. Um, I should let you know, I guess one of the things that I do is a major portion of my job is federal shortage area designations. So it's designating areas for primary care, mental health, and, and dental providers in the state as far as looking at those and then seeing if they qualify as meeting federal shortage designation criteria. Uh, I really won't try and spend too much of that, my time today on that. But uh, to kind of give you a little bit of a background is that's some of the work that I've uh, been doing as well as in our own office. We have the state shortage area designations, so we have some of our own criteria that we developed within the state to make determinations then for shortages for uh, these same types of um, specialties and disciplines. Uh, I want to apologize a little bit first. I do have a bit of a a head and chest cold, but hopefully I'm getting over that. Um, what I'd like to uh, first go ahead and let you know is I want to say, uh, again, thanks to the folks at, at Beacon for allowing me to do this and, and for you guys all to participate. Also, I want to thank the uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center's Health Professions Tracking Service and their staff. Uh, they've been uh, wonderful to work with in trying to go ahead and, and provide and put some of this information uh, to share with you. I would like to uh, start this off as far as addressing uh, psychiatric providers in Nebraska 
I know the behavior health encompasses a number of other uh, specialties and disciplines within the behavior health field, but at this point in time, I'd like to focus on the psychiatric providers. What I will plan on sharing with you is going over um, where these providers are in Nebraska. So we'll be looking at some of the latest data that I was able to uh, collect from the Health Professions Tracking Service uh, this, this month, and looking at the physicians, the advanced practice registered nurses, and physician assistants. We'll then look at where they are uh, practicing in Nebraska, the types of their uh, practice locations, also where they did uh, their training. And then what we'll move on to uh, after that is looking at the data regarding for the past 15 years and trying to look at what kind of transitions uh, that we're seeing with their practice uh, out there as well as their ages. And then I will uh, like to conclude with looking at retention associated factors and share with you some of the work that we've been doing on a multi-state study uh, from 2012 to 2016 here and kind of a little bit where we're at with that and hopefully you'll find that kind of information helpful as well. So um, the Health Professions uh, Tracking Service, um, when we go ahead and look at that and say, um, again, where are they uh, in Nebraska and stuff? So if we would go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the Health Professions Tracking Service was organized in 1995. I worked uh, closely with the, um, the folks over in Iowa that have a um, tracking service that I was uh, quite impressed with and looked at for a number of years. And to let you know that this is a little bit unique, this is one of um, two tracking systems that I'm aware of that is continuously collecting information on healthcare providers, their practice locations, and in, in which they work. Uh, this helps us to provide the most accurate, timely information available out there. There are other states in the country that do collect information, but I'm not aware of any that go ahead and collect the information on a continuous basis from both the providers as well as the clinicians have confirmation and follow-up on that. And I think that makes us uh, a little bit unique and uh, also provides us with a lot of great deal of information and can help us with some trend, trending outlooks as well. I would mention that this was a collaborative effort of creating the Health Professions Tracking Service uh, between the University of Nebraska Medical Center and the Nebraska Office of Rural Health. We were able to use some uh, Robert Wood Johnson funds, uh, actually a relatively minimal amount, uh, I think $60,000 over three years. Uh, to give you an idea, and I would say at this point in time, it's probably almost a quarter million dollars plus to uh, to staff and operate that, and it's been a excellent process to be able to see us be able to move from the primary care providers to include dental and also behavior health providers within the state. The uh, next slide, please. Uh, the data is uh, used to facilitate uh, discussions, make informed decision policies, um, and provide information. I think one of the things we're looking at is to, you know, our, our legislators, also our schools, to you folks out there in practice at different settings, and hopefully we can break some of those data and information down for you and share with you on that. <clears throat> One of the things, again, I was mentioning before is the federal shortage area designations and the work that I do with that. Uh, this year, actually, we've been uh, tasked with going ahead and using a new uh, software program, the Shortage Designation and Management System, and I'll be using the data from the tracking service uh, to provide data updates to that system. Again, it's an invaluable tool. And is really um, 
been a great help to all of us. <clears throat> the uh, Nebraska Health Alert Network is also uh, one of those folks here within the Department of Health and Human Services that we use for disaster planning. Uh, again, this involves both primary care and behavior health and notifying folks out there uh, whenever we may have a variety of different types of disasters that occur, whether they're um, you know, environmental uh, things that occur and or diseases. In all of these cases, uh, we all know that the needs to address for behavior health is a critical when addressing a disaster. So having that kind of information in there and being able to get people where they're most needed is, is very crucial to that. The National Health Service Corps and state placement retention studies is something that I've been working on for the last uh, several years here. And I'll address this in a little bit more detail at the end of this um, webinar. But um, again, the data here has been really crucial in helping us with that. Also, we've had a number of folks who have done, um, looked at some of the issues as far as migration studies with that. The SAMHSA block grant application, um, which includes the Nebraska Behavioral Health Assessment and Plan components in there, has used information from the Health Professions Tracking Service as well. Next slide, please. One of the things I think is important to see here is, again, how some of these health policy reports that are being published with the University of Nebraska Medical Center, uh, it's now housed basically in the College of Public Health in the Health Policy Center there has put out a number of reports recently. One that uh, you might be most interested in looking at if you have not yet is the Nebraska Behavior Health Workforce uh, 2000 to 2010, August 2011 report that was put out. Uh, it's an excellent report. It goes into uh, some major depth. And in case you haven't read it, um, I would suggest that you go ahead and do that. Another report was a critical match, the Nebraska Health Workforce Planning Project, final report, September 2009. And that looked at virtually all of the um, different disciplines uh, across the state. But the Behavior Health Workforce uh, report that was done 2000-2010, I think, is an excellent marking. And it is things like this which really help us all go ahead and focus then and be able to provide information as far as where are we and where are we going. And the transitions take some time to uh, impact and also sometimes to be able to um, sit down and evaluate and go over that. Um, there are also a couple other reports in there that I think they included uh, that I know our office has worked with. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what I want to do now is go over the 2015 uh, data. Uh, this is, again, the most recent from the Health Professions Tracking Service. It was shared with me just this month, and I will be going ahead and looking at the different types of psychiatric providers in the state, physicians, advanced practice registered nurse, and physician assistants. Um, I would like you to all keep in mind and be able to provide some comments, questions, so feel free to let us know what information you find to be most helpful and what additional questions you might like to have answered. Uh, I know that there hasn't been enough time to go through all of these, and um, you know there's just tons of things that you can ask questions on. So um, I'd like to share this with you. I should let you know that the information that I've put together here, and we'll go over the next several slides with, are information of these psychiatric providers and, and their primary practice locations. So you don't want to go ahead and have a duplicate count, so we've looked at these and looked at them as their primary practice location. Some providers work in, in more than one location, and uh, for this type of analysis, we're only going to be looking at the primary practice location. We'll look at also their practice location type, um, briefly their training, 
age and then by their uh, birth state. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. To all those participants, if you have questions that you'd like to ask uh, while we're going through this presentation, you should have a question box on your long, skinny control panel related to GoToWebinar. And please feel free to type your question there and submit it. And we'll leave some time at the end of the webinar for Tom to answer questions. Thank you, Amy, and thanks for letting me have a little break there. Uh, get a sip of water. Um, I would let you know, OK, the, the worksite settings in Nebraska that we have here, I think uh, we'll be going, spending a little bit of time with this. But as you can see, most of the um, providers work in a clinic setting. And I will go through these one at a time, looking at the physicians, then the advanced practice registered nurse, then physician assistants. But I want you to go ahead and take a brief look at this slide to see, again, the, the primary locations of where they're at, uh, the numbers of where these folks are located uh, within there. And I should mention, in case you have questions about the governmental uh, settings and the breakouts, uh, these are categories that um, I was able to go ahead and arrive at. The governmental settings were correctional facilities, regional centers, and Veterans Administration uh, locations. Okay, the next slide, please. What we have here, then, is the psychiatric physician locations by their primary practice location in Nebraska for 2015. What you will notice is that the physicians primarily work in, uh, the highest number that work in is in the clinic, excuse me, private practice clinics, then hospitals, governmental institutions, and then at schools. The, it's a little bit difficult here when we go ahead and try and put these as far as overlaying them, um, but I will go ahead and uh, break out a little bit more with the sites as far as, <clears throat> and again, I apologize for it being a little bit difficult to see uh, as far as our primary practice sites, but uh, if you look at the types of settings west of Lincoln, those are primarily going to be in hospital settings. So I'll go on to the next slide, and then we'll show the breakout around Lincoln and Omaha area. And with that, then you can kind of see, again, this slide actually uh, doesn't include everyone. It just includes those that are in this particular view. So those counties, Douglas, Lancaster, and Sarpy, that are in this view, that's kind of the breakout you're seeing. Again, you see the higher uh, proportion of folks working in um, these primary clinic practice settings. And then you're going to find a lot of them that will go ahead and also do satellite work and part-time status in other settings as well. But it's important to note that, again, the primary location that they're in is, is in a primary practice clinic versus when you get further to the west, uh, western part of the state, you're going to see them working more in hospital settings. Okay, if you want to go to the next slide. This, again, is the same one, but again, we're going to be looking at nurse practitioners, and we'll review just a little bit again, looking at the physicians, uh, the physicians working in the clinics, uh, pretty much split between the hospitals and the governmental uh, setting sites out there. And now we're going to go ahead and move on to the advanced practice registered nurses, where we'll see them doing a little bit of the same mirroring, working at clinics, then hospitals, and, and governmental sites as well, uh, with a little bit of an increase in the hospital settings. So if we can, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Look at that. OK, so the psychiatric advanced practice registered nurses, we're uh, looking at them and finding, again, working 
at locations. Uh, we're seeing clinics being the primary one, but again, when you move to the western part of the state, west of Lincoln, you're going to see a lot more of them working in, in hospital settings. Uh, a few clinics out there, so they are starting to, to show up, but uh, hospitals are definitely showing a greater reliance on uh, psychiatric advanced practice registered nurses to fill their vacancies, uh, especially in these uh, non-urban settings. And I think that's kind of a crucial piece, and it'll be a little bit more easy to see that I think the aging factor of uh, psychiatric physicians and the difficulty of getting psychiatric uh, physicians or any providers to be into rural areas, as was mentioned earlier, uh, it creates a pretty major challenge for all of us as far as trying to address that. Um, if we can go ahead and zoom in on the Lincoln and Omaha area on the next slide. And Again, what you'll see is uh, nurse practitioners, again, reflecting the fact of being like physicians, working a lot of clinic locations, uh, but also then being in other, other settings as well. I think, again, you all probably have as good or better ideas of why, uh, but in most cases it's, you know, what providers are available and and willing to practice and where are they willing to practice within the state. I think we're all aware that we had some uh, recent changes in our uh, legislation as far as a collaborating, collaborating agreement with advanced practice registered nurses where that's been uh, somewhat relaxed then, especially for those who have been in practice uh, for some time and uh, don't have as uh, many hours under their belt, they're going to be the ones who are going to have to do uh, some time, spend some time with a collaborating physician or a provider, uh, not necessarily a physician. And those folks will be the ones that uh, I think, you know, this should it should really help us all uh, to open up our state and being able to look at getting advanced practice registered nurses. Uh, being able to want to come to our state and practice and hopefully ease a little bit of the, the burden in there. So, yeah. um, Okay, if you want to go on to the next slide, please. And here we're going to go ahead and go back over again. The nurse practitioner is being primarily in clinic settings, hospital settings, and government settings. It's very similar to what we find uh, physicians doing as well. Now I want to go ahead and move on to the physician assistants. Again, there are very few uh, physician assistants out there, and when we look at their practice locations um, and putting that up there, you can see that they're much more in a clinic setting, so they'd be in a clinic setting in most cases working with another uh, physician out there in a private practice. And since we have very few uh, currently out there, I think one of the things that we want to go ahead and address is the fact that they're training for uh, physician assistants as far as being a psychiatric physician assistant. There really isn't any uh, uh, major breakout um, for that any kind of certification or board uh, examinations that I'm aware of at this point in time that the, that the state requires at all for somebody to uh, basically designate themselves as a psychiatric uh, physician assistant in the state. All right, I think we can go on to the next slide. All right, so for now I'd like to go ahead and spend just a, a few moments going over the, the training and the education of psychiatric providers. Uh, again, these are folks that are within the uh, currently out there practicing, excuse me, within the state. And these folks are, as you can see from their training programs, mostly 
from UNMC and Creighton being the two uh, largest breakdowns uh, specifically for physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and a little less though for physicians though. One of the things that you will primarily see from this is uh, I want you to or point out a little bit is the Indian Pakistan folks, there are approximately 20 some physicians that are from India and Pakistan uh, in the and that's you know something that you don't find amongst the advanced practice registered nurses or physician assistants people generally coming from other states uh, is something that we'll see but not from other countries in those uh, professions so um, and also when you look at training programs if you think of those within the state uh, the University of Nebraska in Creighton, as far as their programs with um, being the primary ones for psychiatric providers uh, within the state, the um, nurse practitioner programs, again, you can see with the University of Nebraska being primary Creighton, uh, the secondary, then from other states as well. And in some of these cases, I have uh, some unknowns, both amongst the physicians as well as the nurse practitioners. Um, we don't have anything as far as it being recorded in their training and education at this point in time in the health professions tracking service tracking system. Uh, for the physician assistants, those folks are either um, University of Nebraska Med Center or Union College, and then from other states. All right, you can go to the next slide, please. What I'd like to look at here, then, is a little bit with the age and discipline of the psychiatric providers. And with this, I kind of want to go ahead and put in a little bit of a um, a line there showing the increase in age or amongst physicians where you can clearly go ahead and see that the <clears throat> age of the physicians, psychiatric physicians, is really uh, at a much higher rate than it is for the nurse practitioners and then for the uh, physician assistants it's actually uh, slightly heading the other direction as to where they're getting younger um, as far as overall proportion of the providers out there. And um, with this, I think that's a very key thing uh, to see. I think one of the things to really take positive keynote here again, and, is the physicians out there, <clears throat> or I should say, excuse me, the advanced practice registered nurses out there under the age of 50, when you start looking at the 46 to 50 year olds, the 41 to 45 year olds, and the 36 to, to 40 year olds, the 31 to 35 year olds, you'll see that uh, there's a, a pretty significant increase going on there. And I want to make sure that that gets picked up that was one of the things I noticed, I guess, from the data on the report that was from uh, 2000 to 2011 on behavior health. Uh, this is one of the changes I think that we've seen is there have definitely been more uh, advanced practice registered nurses in uh, going into the psychiatric specialty and that's having a um, I think positive impact on the the state of Nebraska as far as trying to help with the access of care. <clears throat> uh, the next slide, please. Again, I hope you are all uh, taking a look at this and, and seeing a little bit more of maybe what, uh, just a second here, I'm looking at the slide and it's not exactly the same one that I have, um, but I think it's, uh, 
it, it's showing the same thing that I was just mentioning earlier. Uh, so I'll kind of, uh, again, go back over that from those age, um, maybe it shows a little bit clearer, those age 31 to 50 in there, you'll see that mark number going up for the advanced practice registered nurses there on that. And it's just, uh, it's, it's really helping, again, reflect the fact that I think you can make a, a much more rapid change and occur much more rapid change uh, amongst the advanced practice registered nurses, getting them in there. Uh, the number of registered nurses that we have within the state, advanced practice ones, they can be more quickly uh, adapted and trained in a much quicker fashion and then have that impact show up. It takes much longer for you to do the same thing when it comes to psychiatric physicians because of the pool and the numbers that are in the training programs themselves. And also the, the length of time that it takes through the residency training uh, for each of these uh, professions. Uh, next slide, please. I think we'll go ahead and um, launch a couple questions for all the participants. Yes, great. Thank you. So if you all wouldn't mind taking a quick minute to answer those questions. Uh, one is posed now. You can click either yes or no. I'll give you just a few more seconds to get your questions answered. Okay, about 20 more seconds to answer this question. Okay, I'll go ahead and close the poll, Tom. We have 75% answering yes and 25% answering no. Go ahead and ask another question here. And if you all wouldn't mind answering that question. Give you about 20 more seconds to enter your response. Okay, and the answers to these uh, are pretty, pretty split, Tom, with 55% saying yes and 45% saying no. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, it definitely does sound like there's, a, again, a, a fair amount of need out there. And I think one of the questions here is that, you know, we we feel that there there is uh, one of the issues that has been brought up over time, as you are probably well aware of, is can telehealth address some of those needs? I think one of the issues that we find is that a lot of the providers tend to want to stay located in the um, metropolitan areas and urban areas, not the rural areas. So um, usually one of the first solutions is to go ahead and suggest then that there has to be some way to um, maybe provide uh, greater opportunity for telehealth reimbursement and all the other issues that maybe go with that. And then again, from a behavioral health standpoint side, uh, that'll be something I can let B can go ahead and address it at some future state, but is that the most appropriate, uh, or is it just going to be about maybe the one of the few things and only things that we can find for services out there? So, again, appreciate you all uh, uh, participating in that. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to go ahead and maybe find additional information on uh, the telehealth providers, I know that's one of the pieces that we're looking with with the Health Professionals Tracking Service again, is to how to go ahead and 
document that and kind of keep up with what what's going on in that area. Okay, what I'd like to um, move on to now is looking at data over the past 15 years um, and again I have to thank the Health Professions Tracking Service for going ahead and sharing the information uh, on this and, and helping compile and uh, review it with you. Um, what I'll show you here first is actually just the the birth state of the psychiatric providers. Uh, again, it's not necessarily something you need to look at over time at all, uh, but this is to kind of show you what we have as far as the data out there, and that uh, the we don't have all of the numbers in there. There are like 95 nurse practitioners, there are only 90 that are accounted for in this one. What we tried to do is go ahead and break these out into the, the states that they were most likely coming from. And as you can see, um, for advanced practice registered nurse, Nebraska and Iowa are the top two, with Nebraska being um, the vast majority of them out there. Um, and you would see the same thing across when it comes to physicians as well, uh, that Nebraska is still producing the, the greatest volume that we're going to go ahead and see for psychiatric physicians, uh, followed by Iowa, uh, California, and Missouri. Uh, so we are getting some folks here that are in the Midwest region, and it's important to note that the closer you can go ahead and have people within your state practicing out there or states nearby, uh, the most likely they are going to be culturally competent and aware of being able to address issues, also most likely to uh, be retained within your state. Again, for the physician assistants, we see that, that Nebraska is the primary practice location that those individuals come from as well. So now if you want to go ahead and uh, move on to the next slide, please. And this here is where we'll go ahead and focus a little bit more on then looking annually over the past 15 years. And this is what I've you know, been looking forward to uh, for some time then of being able to spend just a little bit of time going over this with you and others as far as what type of changes that we've been seeing and uh, so we'll go ahead and go over that. But again, keep in mind, you know, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to be able to share those with with Amy through the system here and be able, hopefully be able to address those. Uh, next slide. Okay, for uh, psychiatric physicians, again, we're looking at the years uh, 2000 to 2014. Uh, what's, what we do with this is actually go ahead and at the end of each year there is a snapshot taken of the data and it is archived off and we were able to then go ahead and look at those same numbers uh, the next year at the same point in time, archive it off and then see what changes occurred uh, through those different settings. A lot of times what you will find again is here, and I guess what you're going to be seeing here is just a net change uh, from the previous year. So when you look at it, it's been uh, pretty remarkably consistent as fact of about having about 150 uh, psychiatric physician providers out there. Um, of course, one of the things that it, doesn't necessarily show you by just looking at something specifically like this is the fact that, you know, are they aging? How much are they aging? And from some of those earlier things that you were seeing uh, from the 2015, you would note that the psychiatric physicians are aging at a, at a more rapid rate. And again, that's going to make it much more of a challenge to um, find enough psychiatric providers who are going to be uh, retiring and trying to fill those slots. So if we can, uh, let's go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. Okay. 
So here's uh, where we did a little bit of the breakout then, uh, looking at those over the age of uh, 60. And again, the, the trend is, is upward uh, for that. So again, it's demonstrating that psychiatric physicians are aging. Um, also, when we look at the count of those in the age over 65, the last year in the workforce, um, it's been really pretty remarkably consistent uh, as far as the number of those over the age of 65 uh, that are going ahead and retiring. And I think that's, you know, um, a, a, what I want to say, it's, it's something that we would hope people would stay in practice as long as possible, um, but uh, we're not seeing them leave um, before we would anticipate that occurring. And again, a lot of times the economy will have a, a major impact on that as far as whether someone is going to stay working or not. Next slide, please. And this here is looking at immigrating younger psychiatric physicians. You can see from uh, this one that the, the number of younger physicians coming in is declining. And uh, that, that is uh, some cause for concern to us. I think, again, that shows that there needs to be a need uh, to keep reemphasizing this. Um, there is no way that any of us can go out there and, and kind of crank up the numbers and say, you know, you're required to go into practice um, and choose psychiatry as your specialty. But I think there are sometimes some incentives that can be placed there. More than anything else, I think we all know that making it a um, more of a national priority or a state priority is probably the most important thing, as well as trying to work with our training institutions to share this um, need that we have out there and trying to have them address this need. All right, next slide, please. <coughs> okay, right now, uh, looking at the um, advanced practice registered nurses out there, this again kind of shows you the end of year count, the next net change from the previous year, and again, we've seen a pretty uh, significant increase, and the linear trend on that is that it continues to go up. So at this point in time, it looks like the nurse practitioners are going ahead and addressing the call, I guess, out there, and I think showing the interest. So it's evidently been demonstrated well enough to advance practice registered nurses uh, that they would uh, their services are needed and they're able to go ahead and do this. So hopefully with the training programs that we have within the state, again, you want to make sure that you're trying to do everything you can to target those folks that are most likely to address uh, underserved populations and areas that you're needing. So, all right. Uh, if we can, go on to the next slide. Or did you want to go ahead and ask a couple polling questions here, maybe? Yep, I'll go ahead and get those out here. Or is, we're going to do that after this one, maybe? Just a second. Okay. I think we're going to, yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and do that after this. Just a second. That's right. Um, because I want to go ahead now and kind of uh, shift over, but, you know, hopefully that's given you some good information, background as far as what we have for providers within the state, uh, some of the trends that we've been seeing over the past 15 years, and uh, and hopefully I'll have something there. Uh, you notice I didn't go ahead and uh, do anything to look at the number of psychiatric physicians out there as far as trending because uh, the numbers are so small. And, and again, in addition, there's, there's no specific training or certification uh, for one to specialize in psychiatry for physician assistants in Nebraska. Um, that's not the case for physicians or advanced practice registered nurses, which do have specific uh, residency training or certification training. 
What I'd like to uh, shift a little bit here is going ahead and sharing a little bit with our incentive programs out there to assist in the recruitment and retention of healthcare providers. Uh, the federal programs that we have are the National Health Service Corps program and the J-1 Visa Waiver Program. I'll save a little bit of, uh, here to talk about the J-1 Visa Waiver Program just a little bit, but the National Health Service Corps program uh, that is, has a uh, loan repayment and scholarship program that's eligible then for behavior health care providers. Uh, those are uh, physicians in psychiatry. Uh, they also have it for physician assistants that are mental health and psychiatry. And again, there isn't a specific um, breakout as far as the training on that. I think that varies across from states, but uh, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, how that may be utilized. As far as the National Health Service Corps, uh, some of the other behavior health, they have, um, of course, the psychiatric um, nurse practitioner, uh, some of the behavior health uh, folks that they provide loan repayment for, psychology, clinic and social worker, um, marriage and family therapy, and then license uh, professional counselors. So if uh, you're not aware, usually they have a requirement that you be in a federal shortage area and then they base their amount that they're going to give. It's a two-year loan repayment requirement, for instance, for that program. And with that, they have designation scores that they provide for areas. So in Nebraska, I'll go over a map a little later that shows the six catchment areas. Each of those catchment areas, they have a federal scoring criteria that they use. And at this point in time, if the score it goes from 0 to 26, if the score is over a 14 or a 15, they will go ahead then and provide loan repayment of $25,000 a year for each year, so $50,000 in in loan repayment um, for those, um, or excuse me, $50,000 a year in loan repayment for those years. And it will then be, if it's a score below a 14, uh, the amount will be reduced. And uh, so I know it's been a little bit challenging even for me being a National Health Service Corps ambassador uh, to try and keep up with uh, the different changes that go on with that. But really what they're trying to do is focus their energies on uh, providing the greatest loan repayment and incentive amounts uh, to those areas that are deemed to have the highest uh, needs in the country. Okay, we've got a question uh, now. The, okay, okay. And we've got about 50 percent of the people that have responded. The question is, were you aware of these types of programs? So if um, those that are listening could just finish their responses quick. Give you just a few more seconds here. And 64% uh, said, 67% said that they are aware. So I'll go ahead and close that, Tom. Okay. Okay. The other uh, program we have is the state programs. <clears throat> And there's actually a, there are two of them. Uh, we actually have the state student loan and loan repayment program, but there's also the Nebraska National Health Service Corps state loan repayment program, which uh, actually just started this year. And uh, what we end up doing is individuals who apply to us for a loan repayment, uh, the sites and or the providers, we'll usually go ahead and look at their site location, look at their designation, and their needs, and then we will direct them to the most appropriate uh, program that's going to give the greatest and best fit for them and their loan repayment. Um, in the Nebraska programs, uh, we look at um, clinical um, psychiatry, uh, also master's level health professionals, um, licensed mental health professionals are eligible uh, behavioral health providers uh, for that program. All right. 
There's a um, another question here, I believe. Yep, I went ahead and put that one up. We're interested. Um, those of you who are on the call have had folks that have actually participated in these programs. So I'll give you a few more seconds here to answer that question. And here, Tom, we see 60% of those that answer that question say no. They have not had anyone that has participated. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. It's, it's good to hear whether folks are or not. If you want to go on the next slide, please. Um, we'll go ahead and try and make sure that we get information out to those folks as far as knowing about the uh, programs that are there. Uh, quickly, and kind of look at this one and see from the health professional shortage areas out there uh, across the state. Um, rural health clinics, of course, they end up having a designation um, that we can get for them, and it applies across primary care, mental health, and dental. Uh, just to let you know, from a mental health professional uh, standpoint, at this point in time, that's not something where we generally see mental health providers out there it tends to be more just primary care providers. Uh, other settings uh, that we have though, for instance, the seven community health centers uh, within the state, uh, those are folks where uh, we'll find uh, psychiatric providers uh, potentially receiving a loan repayment. Also uh, correctional facilities, although recently uh, one of the changes in the scoring mechanism uh, that has been used has really kind of taken correctional facilities out of the equation. Um, again, they may have a designation, but their score uh, does not reach a high enough threshold in order for a lot of folks to be qualifying for loan repayment. Uh, it's rather unfortunate, but that's sometimes what occurs. Indian health service facilities uh, tend to be sites that qualify for psychiatric uh, providers as well. And then across our state, you'll see the uh, six catchment areas. Um, five out of the six catchment areas are designated as federal shortage areas. And these shortage areas are generally end up having a high enough health professional shortage area score uh, to see, receive uh, loan repayment. Although, again, it, some of them are kind of on the edge of of not qualifying, we can never quite tell what that number is going to be because the folks who receive loan repayment, it's based on the number of applications that they receive. And so if they receive a significant number of applications um, from higher scoring sites, one year you may qualify and the next year you may not. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Amy, can you make the next slide appear, please? Yep, having just a little bit of technical difficulty here. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Jumped a couple later. There you go. Uh, this is again just to give you an idea of areas that are eligible for uh, psychiatry as well as some of the licensed mental health behavior health folks within the state. Uh, the vast majority of the state is so designated. These are done on a county by county basis, so uh, looking at the ratios that the state utilizes for those, um, again, they can be found on our website if you'd like, but in a couple of these rural counties out there that you will see, uh, there's a psychiatrist spending um, part of their time, a uh, significant part of their time in that area, and that basically precludes them from qualifying, such as uh, Thurston or Fillmore County. Um, but again, that's something that's kind of interesting is that uh, either of those areas would qualify under the Federal National Health Service Corps um, because we use catchment areas, not 
individual county locations. Uh, next slide, please. What I'd like to go over here is a little bit is the uh, state-sponsored J-1 visa waiver uh, program. Uh, those that are, I'm going to show you a little map here of those that are currently practicing in 2014. Uh, we have six uh, psychiatric providers that are currently practicing, and uh, they're in the numbers red there across the state, and you can kind of see where they're at. Um, if you want to go on to the next slide. Uh, to give you an idea or breakdown, I guess, uh, what we've uh, found out there, and I, again, I think the rural urban breakout slide to the left is a little bit off, but uh, I'll get that fixed. Uh, the, the thing that we find here is that, again, uh, uh, mental health providers out there are going ahead and providing a, a portion of the care and services out there across the state. And, and have been uh, participating in the J-1 visa waiver program for a while. Uh, next slide. This will get into a little bit more of the specifics of the top requested J-1 specialties for the state. Again, this is a program that we have available out there. And you have to be able to basically demonstrate that you have not been able to find a U.S. trained physician to fill a location. You want to sponsor them. Uh, these are physicians who are here, international medical graduates. They're on a J-1 training visa. They have to return to their home country uh, for two years, or they can have that waived. And if someone here is willing to hire them who cannot find a U.S. trained physician, what happens is those individuals then sponsor them for three years. And then in their application process, they have to be approved by our office here, the Department of Health and Human Services, and sponsor, we sponsor the application. We always say that the employer sponsors the applicant and we sponsor the application. We state that they have demonstrated that there is this need. It has been met. Uh, so to kind of give you an idea, looking at the uh, past uh, 10 years on this, uh, you can kind of see that we've had about uh, 10 providers out there in psychiatry. Uh, it is one of the top five requested specialties. Um, and, it's, and it's not ex unexpected, I guess, as far as mentioned before, um, retention on this. If you want to go to the next slide, so I'll try and move along here. Uh, so 18 psychiatrists have been sponsored in the past 10 years. Of those, 11 have left the state. and uh, the seven remaining have been here less than five years. So we know that retention is uh, always going to be an issue with this. But again, you're trying to place providers out there where U.S. trained physicians don't want to locate and stay either. So it's not unusual. Um, but we do think feel that this has been a, a very valuable program, not just for psychiatrists, but for other specialists as well. And, uh, and we hope to be able to go ahead and incorporate uh, some of these folks in our uh, retention efforts and training stuff in the coming years. Uh, if you'd like to know more about this program, I'd be happy to go ahead and, and share that with you. We have some of the information also available on our website as far as all the criteria that goes into meeting that. Uh, if it gives you any uh, idea, uh, from this program, uh, an application that then goes to the Department of State and the uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service. It's something that's it's rather uh, lengthy process. I mean, you're looking at uh, about three months once the application is submitted in. Um, and uh, we, we know it's not something that people choose to do lightly, but uh, we are willing to help uh, sponsor these applications. and in needed areas. We average about uh, a dozen applications for all physician types um, per year and have for the past uh, 15 years. Again, I administer uh, this program and look at that. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer those for you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what I'd like to spend a, 
just a couple minutes here is mentioned to you that there is the National Rural Recruitment Retention uh, Network, of which um, I end up being the state's organizational member on that, which means I pay the dues, and then all of you have access uh, to using that system. Of course, one of the things that we've done recently is to go ahead and um, provide a link there to the beacon as far as job practice opportunities. Uh, that again, I think, makes the the greatest amount of sense. I, you know, you want to have it to where providers are going to be looking for job practice opportunities, and so coordinating with uh, the job listing opportunities that Beacon has provided is something we're happy to coordinate uh, with. We also do this in working with the folks at the the dental college, as as well as nursing within the state. Um, I would mention um, with this uh, there is a new ebook version available, and that is something that uh, just became uh, live this past week. So, uh, if you want to go on to the next slide, um, I'll mention to you that this is a pretty comprehensive recruitment retention manual. I know I've worked on it as well as others for a number of years, trying to make sure we keep it up-to-date and, and useful out there for folks. Uh, there are several uh, kind of uh, components, but it's, it's used by local recruiters uh, to help provide and guide uh, you know, some ideas on the process and the steps in recruitment and retention of healthcare providers. Uh, some of the pieces in there would be, for instance, on recruitment readiness. Uh, do you need a provider or not? Uh, going through that assessment, your planning and preparation, uh, searching for candidates, how one screens candidates, and then the follow-up and follow-through uh, with candidates. Um, again, this is something happy to go ahead and help with. Uh, this manual is available at no cost from our office, and the way to access that is I would have to provide and approve you for password access uh, to that. Again, happy to go ahead and visit with anyone uh, regarding that, and uh, if it's something that um, may help, um, I'm happy to go ahead and and do that. But again, we do tend to focus on the underserved areas within the state and underserved populations. So, um, with our limited time, that's where we will uh, try and focus our energies uh, with folks. Um, all right, I think we're ready to move on to the kind of last section on uh, retention. Um, and for this, I'd like to go ahead and, and mention the fact that uh, in 2012, there was a long-term retention study that was conducted by the National Health Service Corps. And with this one, uh, these were some of their uh, quick results. I know we've all been trying to address and figure out uh, you know, what is appropriate retention, and I don't think anybody has really quite figured that out, uh, but one of the things we want to do is do everything we possibly can uh, to enhance retention uh, once somebody has selected your site to come out and practice there. And with that, uh, we've been working on efforts of trying to um, assess basically the providers while they're there early on in their practice, as well as the uh, clinics and sites, and seeing what things we might be able to do to assess and, and improve uh, things for them. Uh, we did take the information uh, from this 2012 uh, study, and uh, someone I've been working with for a number of years is Dr. Don Pathman down at the University of North Carolina Sheps Center as well as the folks at the North Carolina uh, Foundation for the Advanced Health Programs. And with that, uh, we went ahead and did a uh, study. If you want to go to the next slide. <coughs> uh, we have some of our findings and information on this retention study uh, that are out there and available uh, for you all to go ahead and, and, and look at. I think you could find some good information in there. Uh, it's, it's difficult, of course, to specifically 
pinpoint out um, on this, we're, we're hopefully going to have enough data over time to be able to look at different sites and locations, but I think a lot of the information that we have there is is very viable and, and useful to you uh, when it comes to your recruitment retention efforts. Uh, the And this is available uh, for you on our website if you'd like to go ahead and review that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what happened with this is I was kind of uh, spearheading part of the project and so was able to get uh, uh, 10 or 11 other states to come with us um, on this project. Uh, those were Delaware, North Carolina, uh, Kentucky, Missouri, Iowa, Arkansas, uh, Nebraska, North Dakota, Montana, California, Washington, and Alaska, uh, who have participated with us uh, over the past several years. Uh, this uh, slide here is a little bit cumbersome of the fact that it talks about the practice sites uh, uh, recruitment software and I think the recruitment software is really uh, transition, um, uh, maybe be transitioning away and they're going to be uh, using the, uh, maintaining the retention software program uh, that was developed. If you want to go to the next slide please. Uh, with this one, just to let you know, as far as uh, retention uh, collaborative states, uh, continue to work with these folks as well as, well as folks down at the University of North Carolina, um, SHEP Center, uh, again, the North Carolina Foundation for Advanced Health Programs. We have been coordinating also with uh, 3RNet uh, and then several other organizations out there as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, I just want to kind of briefly bring you up on today as far as the retention collaborative and what we've been doing. Uh, year one is that we did design and field a one-time retention focus survey. Uh, this data was uh, some baseline information that we used from the National Health Service Corps. Uh, they had uh, shared with us some of their results. Again, Dr. Down Pathman had been working with them on some of their information. We, will, we were able to incorporate uh, some of that information into our study as well. And then we've been using this to try and work with states out there um, to inform and, and stimulate their, their program improvements. So again, we're all focused at trying to get uh, individuals who are obligated and serving in underserved areas uh, to help out as much as possible and in keeping them there. Uh, we did look at a number of states um, with this as well at, at various programs. Uh, the, the year two design on this one, uh, if you want to go back to that, <clears throat> it's a, a tool that we've been, um, I think it's forward yet, Amy, if that works. Um, yeah, this one here. You two, um, we began uh, putting this together and we've actually developed um, a practice sites retention management system. This is an online um, survey tool uh, that's web-based uh, that states are sharing out there and working with. It's, it's been uh, really excellent to work with and gives us a lot of good information. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to share some more information with you all on that. If you want to go on to the next slide. just to kind of briefly go over these things, but there's, um, <clears throat> and some of the contents and the questionnaires, uh, I know we're um, running a little long in time here, so um, if you want to go ahead and, and look at some of these issues that we have in here, but what we have is uh, several sets of questionnaires uh, that go out to folks at their end of year and end of service uh, ones, it'll ask them uh, about for instance, community ratings, family satisfaction, uh, retention expectations, and then there are some additional questions at the end there uh, talking about the retention expectations as well. Um, the year two uh, piece, uh, portion that we had as far as the administration uh, questionnaire that was added in there, we asked a lot of uh, questions of the sites, uh, what types they are, and how well their uh, people are fulfilling their job requirements and the fit of the providers there. Uh, the next slide, please. 
Uh, one of the things that you would note is with the National Health Service Corps program is we all know that the uh, people are much more likely, this is giving a anticipated retention of providers over time and, and anticipated because, again, working with Dr. Pathman has been doing this for 20 plus years, uh, we do have some indications with responses to questions as far as then what their expectation uh, would be for retention after the first year, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth years out there. So with this one, we're able to show the National Health Service Corps, which is directed a lot more of their money at loan repayment, that that's a much quicker uh, method of getting folks out into practice and also they're retained longer. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things to note here is that we actually did in this part of the study uh, was to go ahead and incorporate also the uh, some of the state programs uh, for doing loan repayment at the same time. Uh, this has actually been the first time that the National Health Service Corps has kind of been put head to head uh, with different uh, state uh, loan repayment programs. And uh, I think the next one will, will break it down just a little bit more uh, as to where you can kind of look at state programs. And again, what you see from that is that the uh, state programs out there are generally far and above uh, the, the National Health Service Corps loan repayment programs. I think the, the only one that isn't uh, above the entire line dipped down is, is California. And, um, I think they had some of their own um, variables there, but I think one of the things that was able to demonstrate is that in Nebraska, our loan repayment program is is very focused, and we are very good at going ahead and getting people who are trained uh, from Nebraska and are also a a very good fit for our locations within the state, and thus we have much longer uh, retention rates and um, We'd like to go to the next slide, please. Some of the things that we were able to find a significant impact uh, in correlation as far as positive retention is in the statements out there uh, from the survey questionnaires, and these are kind of uh, a Likert scale uh, number of uh, questions uh, that are placed out to these folks. and if the family uh, fit to the community, if, if they feel like they have a sense of belonging in the community, uh, their spouse or partner is happy in the community, uh, my children are happy in the community, those have uh, positive impacts then as far as retention over time. Um, and it would be good for you to go ahead and, and note these factors again. They are also in our, our study there that you can go back and look at at another point in time. The other uh, positive retention statements, uh, go to the next slide, please, refer to uh, someone's service practice and work. If the practice has been um, basically an, an effective, if they have an effective administrator perceived to have, that's uh, something they significantly uh, look at here. and. Um, has big impact as far as whether somebody's likely to stay. I think all of us would kind of feel the the same way if we're in a location as far as is this something that we all want to, um, you know, a, a place that we feel that the administration is, is well focused on what they're doing and we want to remain there. Uh, others uh, where work rarely encroaches upon uh, somebody's personal time, I think this is a major challenge, uh, of course, you know, when all of us are looking for a health care provider, we want to be able to go ahead and call them at any point in time when the patients have the needs, and especially out in rural areas, it becomes much more of a challenge as far as finding people, having enough people to share and cover, uh, call uh, time out there so that people get time off uh, from their work and, and don't feel like they're always being pulled back into this. Uh, a third component is the overall if somebody is, is satisfied uh, with their practice. Uh, the next 
component here that we'll look at as far as is that lower retention uh, is associated with uh, we found as far as disciplines of nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and I think you know again you're looking at the the numbers out there, but one of the things that you find with people who are younger and coming out into practice is you know this tends to be more of their first job, um, and that can be uh, somewhat of an of an issue. Um, I don't necessarily think that. You know, again, across states out there, when we were looking at this issue, uh, this is something that that we found. But again, I think it's because the younger age of the providers uh, coming out. So, if you happen to have somebody that's new, out of school, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or a physician, uh, their first job out there, unless it's a really, really good fit. Uh, in most cases, they may be looking to move on um, to another site. Uh, so I think that's something, assessments early on, that we'd like to be able to work with communities and making sure that we've done everything we possibly can uh, to make sure that the fit between the community and the providers is, is working well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so some of the things uh, as far as higher retention, uh, what, what it's associated with, <coughs> excuse me, um, sorry about my cold here. Um, one of the things that we were tracking earlier on and looking at uh, some of the data that we have out there is if somebody is uh, serving in the state where they grew up, um, and again you saw uh, the state where they are trained, uh, Nebraska, is by far, uh, most of them are trained here in practicing Nebraska are from the University of Nebraska Med Center or from Creighton University Med Center. Uh, so I think we all know that it's very important that we have these uh, training programs within our state that are uh, trying to serve us. So whether they're at the University of Nebraska Med Center, uh, Creighton, uh, the Clarkson program, and or Union College or others that these folks are really focused on trying to get uh, individuals from underserved areas and back out serving in underserved areas. Uh, retention component also is, is married versus single. Uh, I think again that would probably reflect a little bit too when folks are um, coming out to first job site, uh, if they're if they're not married, uh, sometimes that becomes more of a challenge for finding a spouse in in more rural areas. I'd say even than in urban areas, but uh, usually there's a a level, you know, of maturity there. But there's also something if they have a family and wanting to settle down in a location. Uh, that's usually why with our state loan repayment program, I know it's a, a three-year loan repayment program, we're always kind of hopeful that the communities out there will be working closely with them and we'll be able to go ahead and, and have them where they're uh, stable in their uh, community and, and wanting to be re remain part of the community out there. Um, also, we found that... Uh, Excuse me if you want to go back to that one just a little bit. So the non-Hispanic uh, white versus uh, minority population was also um, shown to have an impact as well as folks out in rural health clinics and prisons. And I think the rural health clinics, one of the things that we noticed there was that, uh, again, a lot of the physician assistants and or nurse practitioners were much more likely to... Uh, be uh, retained, uh, especially in Nebraska, uh, if they were from the area, or at least from a rural area. Uh, next slide, please. We have about five minutes until we need to move on to question and answer. Okay. Um, one of the things we want to go ahead and look at is the, the next steps for our um, our National Health Service Corps Retention Collaborative thing is to uh, 
is we're going to build on some of this longitudinal information system that we've been uh, putting together. Uh, we hope to be able to use it for uh, for ongoing future. Uh, we're hoping to also uh, be able to manage individuals as well as um, programs out there. As I had mentioned to you, I think, before uh, some of the issues uh, that we have, hopefully we can look at a site and be able to kind of go over some of the questionnaires. If we're looking at retention issues, be able to come back to the clinics and or uh, clinics, I guess, at the sites, and then share with them these are things that we feel are issues you need to be able to address uh, without specifically saying, you know, which uh, providers or whatever else are doing that with you. We would hopefully be able to give you enough of that information up front uh, so that uh, we don't have uh, retention issues and uh, you know, would love nothing better, actually, than to never have to uh, address uh, retention other than the fact that we've addressed it with you well enough up front that it never becomes a problem out there. Uh, the little pieces here too, um, I would go ahead and, and mention as far as the <clears throat> uh, survey uh, that we do out there. And again, I uh, just so that you're kind of aware that this is even going on, but uh, we do a uh, kind of start a service um, where first people first come into the program. Uh, another survey is sent to them at the end of their uh, service year uh, and then at the end of their service contract. And then we also have an alumni uh, survey. Uh, for administrators, clinic administrators out there, uh, we uh, do an end of the year of service. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, from this one, uh, to kind of give you a little bit of an idea, and I, again, I don't want to belabor this uh, really at all, but just so that you kind of have an idea of some of the pieces that are in there as far as the start of service contract, end of, year, uh, end of the year, end of service contract, uh, components out there is in the questionnaires. I think kind of gone over uh, some of these items that we have but we do have some reporting capacities within that to help alert us a little bit more to where we are, uh, feel we may be having problems and then being able to uh, provide some kind of intervention or suggestions, uh, comments to sites out there. And uh, would love to have people uh, you know, participate in this program. If you want to go on to my uh, last slide here. Excuse me. Um, the uh, retention management system here is, is really kind of to give us these things as far as the background needs. Uh, as you can see, their family needs, how it matches up, and then their retention expectations. Some of these things are repeated over and over again as far as re their retention expectations are out there, and, and we kind of look to see whether there's anything that's changing uh, with it over time for the individuals. One of the biggest reasons for this is that we found over the years that if you actually go ahead and survey individuals after they have left their practice, there tends to be a, a bias uh, toward not wanting to you know, specifically address what it was within the community and or the practice. Uh, I think that was would be that most of us would tend to have a little bit of a bias. Um, actually, if you're asked, you know, well, to go ahead and say, well, it, it's not, it's not them, it's me, or whatever um, component they're going to feel, it can be actually the opposite direction as well. Uh, it's them, it's not me, and I think that's something that we're really trying to go ahead and see if we can ascertain while somebody's actually out into practice, and then finding out, you know, if it is actually other family members, uh, whether it's the practice itself, is it something in the community that can be uh, adjusted, or is it really something of where it's just really not a good fit and there isn't much the community can do uh, to address the issues out there. 
So uh, with that, while I'm still able to breathe here a little bit, uh, I'll go ahead and, and stop. Again, I want to thank uh, Beacon and all the rest of you for uh, allowing me to go ahead and participate in this. Amy? Great, Tom. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions here. I'll uh, pose the first one to you. Is the state NHSC <laughs> loan repayment program limiting the number of telepsych hours like the federal program does? Uh, at this point in time, uh, I'll have to go ahead and check. I don't think that we actually have anything, but I'll, I'll check with our staff and be able to get back with you. So the telehealth psych hours, because uh, I agree, I think that would be a, a significant um, question to have answered. But um, I'll, I'll make sure I get that question back to you. I, you know, whether that's something new, I don't know. Good question. Okay. Another question. Since the J-1 visa physicians are not staying in the state, what are we learning from this? Mm. Well, personally, I think one of the things is that we get from the J-1 visa physicians is you never know exactly, you, you know, again, it's we're looking at a fit. And I think the biggest thing that we all know is that to have a fit for a practice out there incorporates a lot of uh, you know, significant terms out there. Again, is the cultural competency piece, I think, is something that is, is huge amongst J-1 uh, physicians. Um, most of them, uh, where we're placing them, is not likely a type of location that they grew up, that they're familiar with, uh, or settings that they've necessarily practiced and trained in. So those are huge pieces. Also, you'd other have other issues regarding the their family, uh, if these are individuals who either do or do not have a uh, family started yet, that can have a big impact on them uh, matching up and, and fitting as well. Uh, personally, I think the one of the, the biggest pieces that we have with this is, is with anybody uh, coming into a practice location is, is having folks out there in the community who are willing to go ahead and um, you know, make people feel like they're a, a part of the community and uh, transitioning um, with them into the sites, uh, irregardless of whether you're J-1 visa or not. And I think that welcomingness by the community is, is going to be one of the things that probably has the biggest uh, attraction to retaining them. Uh, also, the J-1 visa physician program, I think, has uh, been very helpful in a number of cases of uh, being able to, you know, meet certain uh, specific maybe legal requirements that folks have as far as uh, having a psychiatrist available in the area to provide, uh, you know, if, if nothing else, uh, the, uh, the psychiatric medication drug uh, requirements. But in a number of cases, it's also uh, bought some time for someone to go through the training program and uh, hopefully give them more opportunities for communities to look for providers who might be likely a, a better match. Very good. Well, we've had a lot of great questions posed. Um, thanks to all of you that submitted those. And, um, I encourage you to get in contact with me. I have my email there up on the slide. Um, if you have questions that didn't get answered, and I can work with Tom on those. Uh, you've also had some great requests for specific information uh, to be sure that you can follow up with um, uh, the ideas that Tom has posed and the information he's given you. And so we will include further information so you can access everything you need um, in a follow-up email. And we encourage you to share that information with others that couldn't get on the call today. We'll also have an evaluation uh, that we send out as part of follow-up from this webinar, and I really encourage you to complete that. And then note whatever uh, information you think would be most beneficial for you as we move through this webinar series on retention of behavioral health providers. I know all of you have different needs and different um, challenges that you're facing, so it's very important for us to get that information from you so that we can tailor our presentations accordingly. There will be a recorded version of this webinar available for you to view 
and um, we'll give you more information on that in your follow-up emails. Uh, with that, I thank you very much for your participation, and thanks to Tom Rauner, our presenter, and hope you all have a good week. Thanks thank very you. much.